This edition of Computer Club Lesson was recorded on April 20th, 2015. Enjoy. Hello, welcome to Computer Club Lesson. This episode is brought to you by the Binary Guys. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Conti and Natalie Don. Pomplamoose. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Make him the cutest that I've ever seen. Give him two lips like roses and clover. Then tell him that his lonesome nights are over. I chose this introduction uh, to Pomplamoose. Uh, it's a, a video I got from YouTube. Uh, I've known about Pomplamoose for years, and I wanted to uh, give you uh, a quick overview of some of the things that are available on YouTube for your entertainment on your computer. And the best example I could find was Pomplamoose. Pomplamoose uh, music. Um, makes their videos with uh, very high standards. Um, the, uh, they are extremely talented, as anyone can plainly see. Their production values are very high, albeit that they made this video in their kitchen with one camera, a couple of microphones, and a lot, a lot of work. I hope you enjoyed the video. It's just a sample of the kinds of entertainments that are available to you on YouTube. Okay, I've put the camera on automatic. The video won't be that great, but at least the sound should stay in, I hope. Let me know. We should be able to get it on our own computers. That's right. That's what, something media player, what's that up there? Uh, that media player is called VLC. VLC. Now, uh, you can just uh, simply go to YouTube and uh, search for Pomplamoose. How would you say that? P-O-M-P-L-A-M-O-O-S-E. Pomplamoose. Isn't that a grapefruit? That's a grapefruit. Yeah. <laughs> In French, it's grapefruit. Yeah. <laughs> or search for uh, Mr. Sandman. You'll, you'll get that video come up. And a lot of their other stuff. 
So there you go. That's um, that's entertainments. Uh, I know uh, I wanted to do this because I I kind of rushed over what entertainments are available to you. And if you've all got decent computers, uh, even your Windows XP job should be able to do oh, yeah. YouTube videos. Um, so with that said, uh, what else can we talk about today? Or is there any questions about how that video was done? It's just, it's, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They did it all with one camera. And you'll notice that um, there were, I don't know, about 30 cuts in that in that video, 30 cutscenes, because when I um, made the video in, in my software, it found every cutscene, and so there was about 30 of them. So that, but that, what that means is that Natalie set the camera up more than 30 times for each of her, so uh, for each of her voices, for the guitar player, and for her husband to play all the other instruments, the drums and the little piano and, the, and all of the other stuff that he was playing with there, she set it up 30 times and ran through the whole thing again just to get that one little couple of seconds shot. Now, that's dedication. Why would they make their money on this? Well, uh, they make their money by touring. They, they are a, a group. They tour. And they make a lot of money uh, from YouTube as well because um, these um, these videos are monetized through YouTube. So every time somebody plays one, they get they get a penny or two. But we don't pay anything. No, you pay with your eyeballs because there's an ad that you have to watch. Um, Okay, I'm going to uh, I'm going to quickly start up uh, uh, Chrome the Chrome browser here, and if it will come in, I'll give you a quick on how to search for stuff in YouTube because it's not that difficult. Go to YouTube. YouTube.com. You can type it in the, the address line or just um, go to one of the apps. And let's, let's look for our videos. And I have named them Computer Lesson. Okay. I've named them all Computer Club Lessons, and so they should all come up. takes a minute. This is just so slow. <laughs> this is from Google. Yeah. Well, it's it's from YouTube. Okay. It's it's uh, using the Google search engine in YouTube to find this stuff. Come on. Uh, YouTube YouTube videos, <coughs> as I mentioned before, are good for searching for how-tos. Uh, you want to know some more about the software on your computer. Um, search in YouTube videos for how to do um, Microsoft Word, how to Microsoft Excel, uh, how to make a movie. They're all in there. Um, and you search in this line here, now like I said, um, if, if you were to search for Computer Club Lesson, um, all of our lessons would come up listed in this page. Um, Pomplamoose, if you were to type in Pomplamoose there, you get all of their stuff. Um, and if you're interested in um, in artists from, I'm not going to say long ago, but maybe yesteryear, you could 
search their name in there and maybe find them. Um, I have a client, his name is Al Hirsch. Anybody ever heard of him? Yeah, yeah, he's a player. He's a bell. Is he got a horn? Al Hirsch is a band leader. Okay. You're thinking of Al Hurt. Yeah. Al Hirsch was a band leader from the uh, late 40s right through until, oh, five years ago. He's in his late 80s now. Um, but a lot of his stuff, um, da dance and swing music and jazz, is on YouTube. Al Hirsch. Okay? If, if that's a name from yesteryear. But if you look it up, his stuff is there. Well, the Williams comedy skits are on there, too. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of stuff. Now, let's talk about, for a minute, uh, YouTube videos with, uh, with content in them that maybe shouldn't be there. If I can get past the mistakes that I've made in this camera, and this video does turn out good today, I'm going to embed that Pomplamoose video into our listen video. Now, I don't own Pomplamoose's stuff, but I will write them a nice letter saying, I used your stuff in a teaching video. Uh, are you okay with that? But I will not, um, I will embed your video in my lesson and I won't have it so that it can be pulled out of the video I'm making. Okay, so your stuff will be safe from piracy. If I have, if you can give me fair use to have your video as part of my lesson. And ordinarily, um, they would say that's okay because I checked and, the, and they have a Creative Commons license. You've already done it. I've shown it to you. I have not <laughs> spread it around. Okay? I have not spread it around. But if I embedded it in a video and sent that video to you, have I compromised the license? Yes. I'd have to get permission from them. And so I will be doing that. Um, Are they local people? No, they're from California. Um, so, entertainments, um, and by the way, the, there's a history here of what I've been looking for. Um, I had to repair a printer um, last week for a client. There's my search for his printer and, um, and the, tear, the, the teardown of that printer on how to fix it. So I bought the parts and I watched the video and I repaired his printer. I don't do that often. Um, other things, well, here's the cordettes. I looked at the, I looked for them this morning. There they are. Um, another video that I, you, there's Mr. Sandman right there. Um, and there's a lot of other uh, Pomplamoose stuff here just because I looked up that one thing. Um, I've looked up quite a bit on how to use my Pinnacle Studio software, and so that's in there as well. Um, it get, it's, gives me a sort of a running total of what I've done over the last month or so if I want to go back to it. That's, that's a, a great feature of it. So this is all safe to be in there? Yeah. You're not gonna no, you're not going to run into problems. Um, you're safe enough to go scrounging around through YouTube or I wouldn't recommend it. Um, going to video download sites is quite another matter. Yeah, don't be doing video downloads from places uh, like Mega Download or something like that. Um, you're just asking for trouble. Because stuff can be embedded in videos and then when the video plays, uh, it's it, the first thing it does, uh, the computer does, is it goes through the first part of the file looking for how do I operate this file and if the first thing it finds is an executable file it'll do it. It'll do it. 
And then if the next thing it finds is your video, well, it'll play your video while it's executing the file. Okay? That's not a good thing. Okay, any, uh, let's get into some Q&A and see what we have on order for today. Yes, ma'am? On my new computer, I get some email that I can't open. Um, what do I need to adjust? Because um, obviously, I, it just says that if I want to save it and try to open it in a different manner, but I don't know what's in the computer uh, system or um, so, the first thing you have to look at, and, and there, it should be uh, part of the attachment that you're looking at, is uh, what is the file extension, okay? If it's a JPEG, JPG, it should open because the computer, uh, all Windows computers can open a JPEG. But uh, if it's a movie file, and it's not in the, in the right format that Windows can understand, an easy format um, like uh, WMP, Windows Media Player. Um, it, the file will open and play as a movie, but if it's in MPEG-4, MP4, uh, you need special software to open it. And that's why it's not, it's saying it can't open your, your attachment because it does not have a program to open it. What you need to do is look at the file extension and then figure out what programs open that file extension. Um, like what am I looking for here? Like what the it? name dot something. Okay. All right. When I go on my XP, they all open. So yeah, that's because you have, missing. yeah, you're missing a program. Um, to open that uh, that file. So what you want to look at is um, the name of the file dot something. It'll be a three letter, a, yeah, a three, um, this file dot a three letter suffix. And that's the file extension. And the file extension is what tells the computer what program to launch to play the item. Now if it's a movie, yeah, um, there is a player, the, the one I just used, VLC player, that will play everything. Everything. There isn't anything that won't play. Um, if it's a piece of music and it's an MPEG, uh, an MPEG-2, uh, it may not play it. Or AAC, which is, um, which is an Apple, um, the Apple iTunes um, extension. Um, so you've got to understand what the file extension is, and then you can go looking on the internet, uh, file extension dot something, some, dot something, um, pro, and then program. And then Google should tell you, oh, you need this program to open it. But, At that point, it tells me what I need. Yeah, it tells you what program uh, will open it. Now, you can go and, go and get the program, Carefully, carefully, um, or you can do without. Um, if you can, if you can figure that out, ask me next week, and I'll tell you where and what program to get to do something. But the file name plus the extension, like this file name here, travel.txt. .txt is the file extension. It's telling the computer, open this with Notepad. Okay, so that's why files won't play. Any more questions? Yes? I want to know how to play bridge. You want to know how to play bridge? Um, you can play bridge online. I know that. You or you can buy the game. Why not online? It's there. Hmm? Yeah. If it's bridge online, base. that's how I want to access it. Bridgebase.com. Bridgebase. Yeah, all one word. Well, there you go. I don't use it, but you can try Bridge. B-A-S-E. B-R-I-D-G-E-B-A-S-E. Bridge, as in base. walkover, base, B-A-S-E. Dot com. Dot com. And, and, and then you get players and everything. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, you play on the internet. You get them from all over the world. Great, thank you.
Good information. Thank you. You're very welcome, and it's very enjoyable. Any other questions? What about that notepad thing you were talking about last week? Okay, uh, happily I will run over that again because, um, as I said before we started, uh, the video uh, from last week went nuts and there was no sound on it. So I will happily go through this again. First thing, I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Uh, Dale Carey gave me her notes, and in her notes was this trick. So I think she showed it to you a number of years ago, but it's something that I had forgotten how to do and forgotten what it was for. And I want to thank Dale for pointing that out to me and for letting us all know again that this is available. The first thing we're going to do is open Notepad. And the first thing we're going to do once we've got Notepad open is we're going to make the entry on the first line dot capital L, capital O, capital G, dot log. Now let's stop here and figure out what we want to use this notepad for. We can keep track on a daily or an hourly basis of little bits of information. If you're a diabetic and you take your blood every morning and you get a reading, you can write it down on a scrap of paper or you can go to your computer in the morning and you can make that entry of my blood sugar this morning was 6.5. Okay, so let's figure out what we're going to do with it. Let's call the, let's save this notepad before we even start as we will call it uh, diabetes testing. We'll save it. Now, it says right here, diabetes testing .txt. and at the top is dot capital L capital O capital G. If I, um, I believe I saved this to the desktop. Where did I save it? I think I did. There it is. I closed Notepad, closed the program out, and now I'm going to open it again. And look what it gave us. I didn't put that in there. It's 1.40 p.m. on the 4th of the 20th of 2015. Okay. Because it has this dot log, every time you close Notepad, it will put the time and date in Notepad as an entry. The time and date. Well, think about that for a minute. So let's make our entry for our diabetes test this morning, and we'll call it uh, 6.3. And we'll, we're going to save it, and then we're going to close it. We open it again. It gives us the time and date we made that entry. Now think about it for a minute. You do that every day, maybe twice a day, and in a year you've got three to 600 entries, or 350 to 700 entries. Okay? But they're all there with a time and a date. You don't have to do it. The program does it for you. <clears throat> you can make these notepad um, files with .log for just about anything you would want. If you keep a daily track of your mileage on your car, great. Put it in every day and it will give you the date you did it. Yes. You can do more than one at a time. Yes. Days. Well, you you would for the mileage on your car, you would have to have a separate notepad. You would save it as car mileage, save as diabetes. 
save uh, you could save one as um, whatever your little heart desires really uh, if you need to keep track of something um, money in your pocket if at the end of the day if you take your money out of your pocket and you put it on your dresser and you count it okay make that entry money in your pocket if, <laughs> and then next day if you money in your pocket do you have more or less okay it's a good thing to know or you put the money in a piggy jar money out of your pocket dot txt at the end of the day you make that entry and in a year's time you would be amazed at how much money is in your piggy jar <laughs> So you see that this kind of thing is extremely useful. Um, and Notepad does it for you. I'll just, I'll just make another one here. For tomorrow, or let's say it is tomorrow, and you get up in the morning, your blood is 7.5. You save it. And once you've closed it, you open it again. 7.5 with tomorrow's day. Excuse me, when you save it, that screen doesn't come up again with save as. No, you only save as the one the first time. Okay? If you do a save as again, it will make another file. Okay? You and ever ever after you've done a save as and you have the single file you're working with, from then on it's always safe. It's always safe. Just think. All right, so there, did, um, you open this up tomorrow, and there's tomorrow's date, your 7.5. And that's a great thing to take to your doctor when you go. Print that off and say, here's my uh, diabetes testing every day for the last month. That's valuable information for your doctor. Or if you get new prescriptions, Put the name of the prescription and the prescription number in a prescriptions.txt. And you can see when you're getting them, what the number is when you have to call the pharmacy for a repeat. And you can file that off for your doctor, print it off for your doctor, as a reminder to them that they have prescribed you a drug. Because, let's face it folks, they forget. And I am finding now that I'm getting a little older and I'm seeing my doctor a little more often um, that she is prescribing things for me and not thinking about what she prescribed last month. And when you get into your 80s and you've got more things wrong with you than termites in a hill, it is little wonder that overprescribed in medication at an advanced age is taking lives. It's sort of up to you to keep track of it because let's face it, your doctor may not. Your pharmacist will if he's any good. He might say to you, he might say to you as you're filling your prescription, you know, you're taking 30 drugs now. This is one more. But he's not going to say that to the doctor. No, not if he wants to keep his license. But you can say it to your doctor if you've got a list. Are you sure I need all this stuff? And in the doses you're giving me? And so the doctor is sort of obliged to go through the list and say, well, maybe you can do without this now. Okay? Sort of, that's a thing that's up to you, but a notepad log will help you do that. There's the evidence. Okay, so that's notepad log. Anything else? You just walked in. Do you have a question? Yeah, well, I got lots of questions, but I want to see you afterwards. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we've got uh, 15, 20 minutes to go here. Um, Anything else? No.
What? If a program's not responding, the best way to get around it is task manager? And it, is, it is indeed. Um, let's let's just, for the sake of argument, open up Notepad again, but let's say that this Notepad was um, some really big fancy taking up all kinds of room and resources program and all of a sudden it crashes. And you click on the X until your little heart's content, nothing happens, and you get program not responding. You can't do anything with it. Um, you can even go down here in the taskbar and right click on the task that's open and the last entry is usually close, close the window. Okay, you can go on that and try that and it doesn't work. You're stuck. The way to do that is to go to the taskbar down here and right click on it and you will see an entry for start task manager. <coughs> now, task manager is show, uh, under applications running is showing me what we have running. We have two instances of Notepad or whatever program that you have open. <coughs> Excuse me. Internet Explorer is prone to crashes like this if it's doing too much. Um, any other program on your computer can crash at any time, even your printer. So the way to get them under control is to go to the task bar, right click on it, get task manager open, and under the applications panel, this one, first one right here, you will find the running program. And it will usually say unresponsive or not responding. So you highlight that program and then you can click on end task. If the program has crashed, it may very well say to you, well, it's crashed. There's, do you want me to keep on trying to end this program um, with a little um, notification window? And you click yes, and eventually it will close it. It will close it. It's, uh, it's called a kill. That's how you kill a program. And the same thing with this one here. Um, we highlight it, end task, and it's gone away. If it's gone, does that mean it's gone totally from the computer? No, no. You've just, you've just closed the program because it was unresponsive. You couldn't do anything with it. And like I said, Internet Explorer is famous for this. You can open it up, start doing things, and then all of a sudden it just stops responding. You can't. And you, can, and you can start it again. Yes, you can start it again after after you have after you've killed it. You can start it again. So I'll start this um, this again, and there you see in Task Manager, I've opened it again. Okay. So Task Manager is what you need to um, to get control of a program that is unresponsive or acting erratically. Uh, sometimes your mail will do that. If you've got uh, lots of mail coming in, your mail, your mail program will become unresponsive because it's waiting for the mail, um, the mail to be downloaded and it's just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. You lose connection and all of a sudden your mail program doesn't work anymore. It's a good way to get a whole, get control of misbehaving programs. Is there another way? Um, outside of logging out. Logging out will also kill an unresponsive program. Not, not restart. If you click on your start button and you go to the, er to the arrow beside shutdown, there's a little arrow there, and if you click on that arrow, it will show you more things you can do. You can switch users because there's two users on this. It'll, it'll allow you to switch. You can log off. Logging off will kill all running programs. Okay. 
If you switch users, no, it won't kill all running programs. It's just opening another user. The running programs remain running. What you want to do is log off to uh, kill all the programs. It's a lot faster than doing a restart. You can log off in 10 seconds and log back in again. Yeah, if you want to restart, shutdown. if you want shutdown. No. no, a restart is a shutdown. But if you want to restart, you're looking at maybe five minutes. So it's a, it's a way to get a hold of an unresponsive program right away. Okay, it will kill it. Anything else? Bob, I forgot to write down what size of a flash drive I would need if and when I start to import export my email stuff, my email package. But suppose if I want to use the same local one and put it in a new computer. Yeah. What size of a flash drive? What kind of a flash drive? I would say 16 to 32 gigs. 16 to 32, okay. Yeah. I wasn't, I had forgotten to write that down when yeah. you did mention. Is that the same as they call the thumb? Yeah, a thumb drive is exactly the same thing. Flash drive. Yeah, flash drive, thumb drive, exactly the same. Now, when you're going to do this, mm -hmm. um, export everything to your desktop. Put it in the desktop. Yeah, first, and then move it to the thumb drive. Okay, oh, okay. Okay. Because, I mean, in your email, in my email now, I have the import, export, and right. the settings and everything. It says yeah. it's going to come all, the whole thing will come. Yeah. So, but first to desktop. Yeah. If you export it directly to a thumb drive, yeah. um, sometimes Windows doesn't, Windows doesn't really understand what you want to do, and it will not bring everything. All right? So doing it to the desktop and then moving it to a thumb drive, and then when it's time to bring it back, you move it back to the desktop, okay? okay. It's, a, it's a, an extra step process, yeah. but I have found over the years that working with thumb drives, especially importing and exporting email, you can get into a lot of trouble if you don't go through that step of exporting to the desktop first. Okay. That's good. I want to transfer pictures from my iPad photos, I mean, from my iPad to my computer and then to a flash drive. Is it a complicated process? Unfortunately, it is a complicated process. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, the Apple software on your computer right now? Do, do you have... Um, I think not. Yeah. You, you want to download and install um, iTunes. It's a big download, but it's uh, if you just follow the steps as they're giving, given to you, uh, you can download and install iTunes. To your computer. Yeah, on your computer, whether it's Windows or an Apple, it doesn't matter. Then what you need to do, once that's all done and you're sure iTunes is working, you're going to get a cable like this especially for your iPad yeah. and you're going to plug it into your computer with iTunes open. Okay, so you open iTunes and then you plug this in. <coughs> iTunes will see your iPad, your iPod, your telephone, anything Apple. iTunes will see it. Your computer will not see it unless there is, your Windows computer won't see it unless you have Apple iTunes. It won't see it see, in the file manager. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. It will only see it in iTunes if you have an Apple product. And from there, you can then um, navigate through your, the file structure of your iPad or your iPod and save the pictures locally to your computer. Um, doing a sync is not a great idea. A sync? Yeah. A synchronization. Yeah, well, please explain. 
A synchronization would be to copy everything on your iPad to your computer. And everything on your computer that is Apple, or in that file structure, to your iPad. So it's a two-way thing. Yeah. Synchronization. That may work the first time, but unless you've gone in and changed the setup from this two-way synchronization to a one-way sync. Okay, unless you've changed it to a one-way synchronization, the next time you sync, you'll destroy everything that you had. So, synchronization is not a good thing. Do it by hand. And if you have problems with it, there are plenty of YouTube videos to show you how. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, we've pretty much beaten this up. Uh, our hour is up. Anyone, last questions? Small question? No? Yes, no? What's your opinion about using, instead of going out and buying expensive ink for a printer that I may not be needing shortly, uh, buying just one of these little printers that cooks into your USB port a little. You not heard of those? No. Okay, Walmart sell them. I think you can just hook a USB port and print. I don't think it scans or anything. It just will print. Oh, okay. All right. And they're like 60 bucks? Yeah, when so I heard 30 or something. Yeah. Get me through until I... Because I don't so, want to go buy expensive ink again. Um... I think I talked about this uh, quite a while ago about what the price of ink is. I think I told you all that if you take an inkjet ink, tear it apart and dump it into a gallon bucket, and you do that until you have one gallon, you will have spent $8,000. Yes. Printer ink Inkjet ink is $8,000 a gallon. And you thought you paid a lot for gas. Is the laser jet the same thing? Uh, the laser an HP laser jet is usually uh, a toner type printer. Okay. Now toner cartridges are expensive compared to um, inkjet. But you get a lot more. Out of an inkjet printer, you might get 30 or 35 high quality photographs. Um, out of a high quality laser jet toner printer, you might get 300. But the cost of the ink for the, for the three ink pack or the five ink pack could be well into $100. Okay, the cost of toner in a color laser jet printer is about $120 a toner, and you've got to buy four of them. But so you've got to do that calculation: Am I making a lot of copies, and how many copies can I make for all of this toner and all of this ink, and where do the two cross? I mean, it's, it's mathematics that's going to make your head hurt. But you must do it. You must do it. If you're doing a lot of printing, high quality printing, um, laser printer is the way to go. If you're doing a lot of high quality photographs, you really need to use an inkjet printer because there is no uh, high quality photo paper for a laser printer. Um, I, I have tried to buy high quality, I have uh, a laser printer, a, a good quality um, laser printer at home, and I've tried to buy photo paper for that laser printer and have always been disappointed. So the glossy high-end ink, inkjet um, photo paper for inkjet printers gives you superior results if you're doing photographs that you want to keep. 
like wedding pictures and such. They're like anything else. If you leave them out and abuse them, yes, they will fade. But left in a photo album in a drawer, they're going to last a nice long time. I have some documents printed out by a bank. And I took them out about five years since I got those documents. And the ink was almost non-existent. Yeah, all depends on what, yeah, on what they used. Uh, if they used uh, thermal paper and the printer that they were using was a thermal printer, all, it did, all it's doing is burning an image onto the paper. And that's the name thermal, burn. I, if I put it up to the lake, I could read it. Yeah. So, uh, so they may have used uh, thermal imaging. Um, that is only a temporary thing in your red. It's only about five years. Um, the, the, the gas receipt you get at the gas bar is uh, on thermal paper. If you leave it laying around for a couple of months, like I do, before I put them into, into a folder, I hadn't looked at they, it for five years. Yeah, they will fade. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's probably you got, you got a copy on thermal paper. Yeah, well, sometimes, yeah. Yeah, sometimes the, their technologies are not as good as what you might buy elsewhere. Isn't there different kinds of light fastness quality too? Um, yes, there is. Um, if you buy, uh, if you have an HP printer and you buy HP ink for it and you pay the freight at $35 or $40 pop, uh, those inks are pretty steadfast on, an, on um, inkjet photos and paper. If you buy for that inkjet printer um, off-brand, and it will work, uh, you may have that problem of fading over time because it's, it's off-brand. It's not the same thing. It's close, but it's not the same thing. And if all you want to do is get close and have it for temporary, sure, buy the off-brand ink. But if you want to have that as a keepsake for a long, long time, you're always better to buy the original equipment manufactured inks for your printer. What do you mean by off-brand? Um, you go to Inkjet Island. <laughs> Okay, at the store over there, they refill your cartridges or you can buy refills off-brand. Or you buy them from China. Yeah. Or you buy them from 123inc.com, where I get all mine. Okay, that's it, folks. Thanks very much for coming. Um, I'm going to do my best, I think, with this. I think I finally solved out the problem. That's Computer Club lesson for today. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.